Hello members and people of the podcast. Welcome back to the Yorkshire Witch, Mary Bateman. So, we're going to continue now in the chapters. Christ is coming, and it does say Christ, not Christ, C-R-I-S-T, just so we're clear on that. Anyway, the extent of John Bateman's awareness of or or complicity in his wife's criminality at this point can only be guessed at. They removed as a couple to new lodgings in Black Dog Yard. Another shrewd and necessary relocation in view of Mary's increasing notoriety. Black Dog Yard was within the area of Leeds, known as Bank, and the Black Dog Inn close to the junction with the East Street and Cross Green Lane. Bank was the focus for those property developers mentioned before in the story, who capitalised on the cheap land upon which to build the haphazard development of back-to-back housing, which they rented out to the poor workers invariably employed in the numerous mills proliferating in Leeds at the time. While some of the terraces were never finished, the building of others was begun in open fields, as the tenements of slum dwellings grew. Access was gained by a narrow tunnel reaching the back halves of the house, well, houses of narrow, unmetal roads, thus saving ground so that even more houses could be crammed onto a site. After all, access roads and pavements were wasted space, which brought in no rent to the landlord whatsoever. Inside the houses, they were cramped. Two rooms, one up, one down, about 14 feet square, often with a cellar, presenting an additional rental income when let out as a one-room dwelling. The precise conditions in these holes were not officially catalogued until the 1830s, when the Whig government of that decade appointed Edwin Chadwick to carry out his investigation into the working classes. So although the details that follow post-date the Batemans period, They nevertheless reflect conditions in the opening years of the century. One 17-year-old flax mill worker named Eliza Marshall told a government inspector in 1832, I live in a cellar. I pay one shilling a week for it. I have no mother. I live with my little sisters. Eliza had worked in the factories from the age of nine, and by the time she was 11, she was starting to go lame due to the long hours and harsh conditions. By the age of 17, she was too ill to work, and there was no pipe, piped water supply, proper sewerage systems, the necessary lavatory, was often a wooden screen, round a hole dug in the ground. Sometimes there weren't even any out officers or outside toilets, so people used a bucket, which would be then emptied onto a common midden heap in 1832 during the first and one of the worst cholera epidemics to hit Leeds. 75 cartloads of soil were removed from just one of the privies in Boot and Shoe Yard in Kirkgate. Over a decade later, things had not improved, as a report on the sanitary conditions in Leeds published in 1845 stated that, by far, the most unhealthy localities of Leeds are close squares of houses or yards, as they are called, which have been erected for the accommodation of working people. Some of these, though situated in comparatively high ground, are airless from enclosed structure, and being wholly unproved and unprovided with any form of under drainage or convenience or arrangements for cleansing or cleaning or one mass of damp and filth, the ashes, garbage and filth of all kinds are thrown from the doors and windows of the houses upon the surface of the streets and courts. The privies are few in proportion to the inhabitants, 
they are open to view both in front and rear, are invariably in a filthy condition and often remain without removal of the filth for six months. However, in Solibrations, the Batemans new surrounding where the conditions of filth alluded to above were yet to reach their zenith. The fact remained that they were a safe mile or so from Marsh Lane. They were also a decent remove from the Anchor Inn in Kirkgate, where the proprietor, uh, Mr Crooks, had recently outwitted Mary's attempt of theft of a watch. She had had more success, however, in stealing some linen laid out dry on a hedge. A hedges and bushes that were often used to dry out linen or any washing that was outdoors, especially in summertime in the fresh air, while the sun bleached it, especially where there were no open fields to use as tented grounds for the same purpose. This bold thief was Mary, of course, she had no care in the world to just swipe it from under the nose of the lad who'd been set to watch over it. No doubt he received a serious scolding later for his inattentiveness. Doubtless Mary continued with her deceitful ways, keeping up her thefts and malign ministrations to the susceptibly needy. However, it was while the Batemans were living in Black Dog Yard that Mary conceived of her most masterly and far-reaching scam to date, with a cash incentive to exploit the variations to orthodox Christian beliefs which flourished towards the close of the 18th century. As religious tolerance gained in strength, the growing and rising from the beliefs to the ministries of the self-proclaimed prophetess Joanna Southcott increased in popularity. Her following flourished in the climate of expectant frenzy whipped up by her and the assertions of other visionaries that the return of Jesus Christ was imminent. Another zealot emerging in the arena of religious radicalisation was Richard Brothers, who, in 1793, declared himself to be an apostle of the new religion, proclaiming himself to be Prince of the Hebrews, a literal descendant of the biblical house of David, and the nephew of the Almighty, who decreed he was to rule over Israel until the return of Christ. To put into context the implausibility of belief in the unbelievable exploit which Mary put into practice, both Salcott and brothers, whose careers overlapped, but attracted quite a following in spite of their apparently far-fetched assertions. Joanna's devotees, referred to as the Southcottians, were said to be numbered over 100,000. Around the year 1792, Southcott had become persuaded that she possessed supernatural gifts. She wrote and dictated prophecies in rhyme then identified, identified herself as the woman spoken of in the book of Revelation, who would give birth to the new Messiah. Incredibly, at the age of 64, the Virgin Southcott announced that she was indeed pregnant and would in due course be delivered of the Messiah himself, the man-child, the Shiloh of Genesis, Shiloh, I think, of Genesis, the date of 19th of October, 1814, was that fixed for the birth. But Shiloh failed to appear. It was given out that Southcott was in a trance. She died not long afterwards at the end of December, her followers refusing to release her body for some time, as they believed she would indeed rise from the dead. They agreed to her buried. Only after the corpse began to decay, Richard Brothers based his declarations on the premise that he had a special divine commission, claiming to hear the voice of an attending angel who proclaimed to be him the fall of Babylon the Great, which, according to Brothers, was in fact London. 
His plea for mercy was apparently heard by God, and London was spared. Brothers was also anticipating the arrival of the heavenly lady who, descending from the clouds, would shower him with money, love and happiness. In February 1792, declaring himself a healer with the ability to restore sight to the blind, he drew large crowds, not so much in demand for his alleged healing ability, as for the small gifts of money he paid out to those he prayed for, ordained with a special role of gathering and returning the Jews to the Palestine, in particular the Jews who were hidden amongst the population of Britain. Brothers maintained he would achieve this by using a rod he had made from wild rose bush, with which he would perform miracles, much as Moses had done with his staff, to produce water from a rock and to put part the Red Sea. Later on, in consequence of his prophesying, the death of King George III and an end to the monarchy of Great Britain, Brothers was arrested for treason in 1795 and imprisoned on the grounds of being criminally insane. From a private asylum in Islington, Brothers predicted that on the 19th of November 1795 he would be revealed as the Prince of the Hebrews and ruler of the world. However, when the date came and passed without any such manifestation, his delusioned followers drifted away, many swelling the ranks of the South Cotians. Brothers spent the last thirty years of his life designing flags and uniforms and drew up plans for a palace in the New Jerusalem. His release from the asylum was finally secured in 1806, the same year in which Mary Bateman's Hen laid its first miraculous egg. Like many other housewives of the time, Mary kept several hens to keep a supply with fresh eggs, as her reputation as a fortune teller had begun to suffer as a consequence of the increasing complaints inevitable from her deceived clientele. Mary changed tack. Jumping on the spiritual bandwagon, announced that she had been granted a vision in which she had been told that one of her hens would lay fourteen special eggs and that the last one would mark the beginning of the apocalypse. By this time, thanks to the impact of the brothers and Southcott, the popularity of millennialisation was assured and gained a remarkable hold on the collective imagination. Right on cue then, one of Mary's ends laid an egg with the inscription, Christ is coming, written on the shell, and it did spell Christ, not Christ. Mary were astute enough to embellish the miracle and shore up her skulky, shaky reputation by claiming that she herself was a devotee of Joanna Southcott, who in 1802 had begun sealing her followers by giving them a special token to mark out as being among the 144,000 to be saved. According to the Book of Revelation, they were the survivors of the 12 tribes of Israel, sealed as servants of God on their foreheads. Mary has somehow managed to secure one of these genuine tokens and, while one should not jump to conclusions, presumably by nefarious means, her status as one of the Southcots was sealed and reinforced her announcement that not only did the eggs laid by her end proclaim Christ's second coming, but that they foretold it would happen very soon, cashing in on the mounting hysteria caused by the pronouncement of the imminence of doomsday, Mary put the prophetic hen on display, charging the faithful between a penny and a shilling to look. Mary also began selling to believers her own version of Southcott's proclamations of faith, special seals, a piece of paper bearing the initials J.C., which she assured would guarantee the bearer admission into heaven following the apocalypse. Thousands of visitors came to be saved, and at the same time lined Mary's pockets. In relatively recent memory, several portents had occurred. In autumn of 1799, the sky had been ablaze with strange electrical storms and lights. On the 19th of November, over Huncoats and Lincolnshire, 
A ball of fire was seen to blaze across the heavens, leaving a trail of flashes behind it. While seven days prior to this celestial spectacle, in the skies above Hereford, the moon was seen to shine with a fierce glow and a large red pillar of fire, preceded to the south by flashes of extremely vivid electrical sort. This display accompanied by short, dazzling flashes and pulses, coalescing together, then suddenly bursting apart, shooting trails of fire across the night sky was witnessed by many. The meteorological fireworks display, taken by most, was typical end-of-the-century foreboding as a clear apocalyptic omen. It's difficult to say how long Mary's holy hoax would have continued and how much more money she would have made. Had a sceptical doctor managed one morning to examine one of her fresh-laid miraculous eggs, he got up early, hid near her house found that the inscription had been written a corrosive, concentrated vinegar. Mary reapplying the message until it was partially burned into the shell of the egg. The misspelling of Christ was also a giveaway. Although by contemporary standards, Mary had what was then considered a reasonable education for the daughter of an agricultural labourer, possibly attained at Sunday school, where she had learned to read and write. Accomplishments she later would use remorselessly against the most gullible clients. When the authorities were made aware of the deception, Black Dog Yard was raided. Mary was actually caught in the cruel act of reinserting an inscribed egg back into the chicken's egg duct, ready to be laid again later. The ruse exposed. exposed. The resulting scandal forced Joanna Southcott to stop stealing her own followers because of the stigma of Mary's fraud. As for the celebrated chicken, Mary profited a final few pennies from the bird by selling it to a still curious neighbour, who on finding that none of the sub- subsequent eggs had laid any with any mystic messages, wrung its net and put, neck and put it in the pot. The records are obviously silent on the authorities, who would eventually stop Mary in her tracks. There was no Yorkshire constabulary in the modern sense of the term until the 1830s, when boroughs were given the right to establish police forces along metropolitan London lines in their own areas. The men who raided Black Dog Yard were almost certainly constables of the watch under the direction of the magistrates. Oddly enough, after toying with people's religious devotions for the better part of a month. Rather than for the monstrous hoax she played out, Mary was most resented for her cruelty to the chickens. And it is the image of Mary holding up the miracle egg which graced the frontispiece of a book detailing her exploits, trials and execution, which would run to the 12th edition two years after its first publication in 1811 two years after she were hung. This engraving of Mary was a somewhat emblematic representation of the Yorkshire witch, along with the infamous egg. On the writing desk at which Mary is sitting is another item with religious overtones, a bottle bearing on the label the words M. Bateman's Balm of Gleed. Balm of Gleed is a high-quality ointment with healing properties extracted from resin taken from a flowering plant in the Middle East. The Bible uses the term balm of gleed metaphorically as an example of something that has healing properties, soothing powers. It's just an illustration really. You know, it's a jibe, but it has curative um, in it. So, you know, that actually later became Mary's hallmark. The further poignant inclusion in the engraving is that of the pens and ink on the desk, and a letter addressed to William Perigo, whose significance will become apparent in due course, guys, in due course. Mary's exploitation of the Southcott phenomena was not, however, restricted to her prophetic chickens. Perhaps in a bit to avoid the local fallout from her apocalyptic predictions, capitalising on the susceptible nature of unquestioning Southcottians, Mary contrived to combine a convenient 
sorry, to combine a covenant removal from Leeds with another fraudulent undertaking and took a trip to York. Enough time had passed since the last hasty departure from that city when she had fled to Leeds in 1788. After the thefts from her then mistress had come to light, so on arrival in the city, Mary astutely sought out and attended meetings of York Southcott followers. The licensed registrar kept by the authorities at the time recorded all Protestant dissenters meetings confirms a proliferation of such gatherings in the city, which licenses granted for worship in private houses before a national network of Southcottian chapels were established after 1811. Posting as a devoted follower of Southcott, we can imagine Mary, the consummate actress, joining in with the proceedings, which included the dis- distribution of wine and cakes, him singing, the reading of Southcott's prophecies, and the lifting up of hands for Christ's kingdom to come. And from one of those York congregations, Mary selected for herself a likely and receptive victim, setting on a poor widow living in alms housing, who she identified as being ripe for exploitation. After following the widow home to find out where she lived, Mary knocked on the door, seemingly at random, and explained that she was a stranger who had come to York for a few days, and she was seeking the company of fellow South Cottians. When the widow told her there were many followers in the city, and indeed she herself was one, Mary congratulated herself on her good fortune in happening upon a fellow believer. She next inquired whether there were any South Cottians in the city who might be able to accommodate her during her stay, as it was a particular wish to be in kindred company. When the widow could think of nobody in a position to offer her lodgings, on seeing Mary's exaggerated and fine disappointment, the window and the charity to offer Mary to share her own bed, even though it would be an inconvenience, she did. And Mary did seem, after all, to be a clean kind of woman. In the 18th century, it was not unusual for people, even relative strangers of the same sex, to share a bed. Difficulties of transport often made overnight stays a necessity, and sharing of rooms and beds was tolerated, particularly in houses where space was quite restricted. Once through the door, next on Mary's agenda, was the re-conner retiring of the widow's dwellings to mentally mark down whatever possessions might be worth stealing, to make a thorough survey, however she would need, the window out of the way. Mary suggested, with another lie, that as she was not at all acquainted with the streets of York herself, perhaps the widow would be kind enough to purchase on her behalf a little meat. However, the widow was indeed quite wary of Mary asking of such a thing, and she was definitely even more wearisome of leaving a person of such recent acquaintance alone in her home. And so a girl was sent on the errand instead. On her return with some mutton, one spoiled, Mary gobbled down the lot, offering only the broth to her hostess, whose refusal to partake of even a spoonful seemed unduly outraged to Mary. In spite of her insistent urgings, the broth was eventually thrown out. Mary herself had refused to touch the proffered dish. In all probability, the widow had avoided being poisoned by her house guest, whose likely intention was to steal the old lady's belongings unimpeded. Mary only stayed a couple of nights with the widow, but predictably, after her departure was discovered, she made off with not only a few guineas in the widow's possession, but also some items of clothing. Needless to say, the widow never laid eyes on Mary ever again. On her return to Leeds following the profitable stay in York, with the memory of the holy hen still fresh in people's minds and having thoroughly worked the bank quarter of the town, Mary and John again moved, this time to lodgings near the old assembly rooms in Kirkgate. Switching her energies and focusing back to medicinal remedies and a sideline as an abortionist, in spite of those clients whose health began to falter after seeing Mary's assistance, her customer base nonetheless remained healthy. 
even if those who took her portions didn't, and her services were again in very high demand. Earth thieving and prophesying weren't entirely sidelined, however. Shortly after the miracle egg debushy, Mary, while benevolently nursing her neighbour, Rebecca Fisher, the expectant mother of seven children, took payment for her charity by stealing two of the children's shirts and a loaf of bread from the household. She also managed to extort money and wreck the livelihood of her neighbouring poor family, whose only living was gained from a horse and cart. When the head of the household passed away, Mary persuaded his widow, left with four children, that the eldest son, aged fifteen, was set on selling what little property his father had left, with the intent of absconding with the proceeds. Mary advised that to avoid this, the widow should sell the horse and cart, and what little furniture she had, leave leads with the cash. The widow, who was in fact stepmother to the fatherless children, followed Mary's instruction to the letter, presumably paid a commensurate sum for it, and disappeared, leaving the children to go into the workhouse. Not to diminish their stepmother's part, Mary must have been fully aware of the fate that would befall the four children as a consequence of her actions. While all the town's charity children in receipt of poor relief were taken into the workhouse, it was cold comfort for the young inmates. Life in the workhouse was hard, especially for children. The first Leeds Parish workhouse had opened in 1638 at the northeast corner of the junction of Lady Lane and Vicar Lane. Here, as in other workhouses, generations grew up in the shadow of an institution intended to be a form of social welfare for those with nothing. In practice, it was seen as a dark and terrible fate and a system which eroded all human dignity. The poor called the workhouses Bastilles after the appalling prison in France, or Paris actually, that was destroyed during the revolution of 1789. There was an enormous and not good social stigma attached to ending up in a workhouse, a very public humiliation that everyone would have been aware of. Thousands of people lived in constant dread that some accident or illness would overtake them, leading to destitution and to that place where husbands were separated from the wives. Mothers from the children. Without these institutions, paupers were given profitless, pointless tasks such as breaking granite with a mallet to grinding animal bones by hand while women scrubbed the floors or sewed sails. Rules had to be obeyed to the letter on pain of harsh punishment, which included flogging and solitary confinement, and complaints about living conditions also invited punishment, as did lack of difference to the master. Dormitories regularly held up to 20 people, with beds of narrow bags of straw that each lay side by side. Levels of cleanliness were low. It was noted in 1797 that the bedclothes in Lady Lane Workhouse were scoured once a year. Heating was absolutely minimal, even in the depths of winter, and paupers' heads were often shaved to protect against lice. Meals, as such as they were, were often eaten in silence, while the able-bodied faced the daily grind of menial labour. For the elderly, the prospect of dying in a workhouse held out the grim possibility of a pauper's funeral in an unmarked grave, or even worse, being dispatched for anatomical dissection. Nobody went into a workhouse willingly. No one. And while Mary was clearly responsible for some truly diabolical exploitation, she was still capable of incorporate, incorporating petty thefts and frauds into a daily life, which ran to securing a free dinner. Finding herself one morning in the shambles, the district of the butchers, that was. That's what shambles is called. And, you know, we still have a shambles street in Barnsley, actually, which is interesting. This was the district of butcher's shops which ran along Brigate from what would now be the junction with King Edward Street up to the entrance of the County Arcade. On overeating, sorry, on overhearing a man from the meadow lane buying 
a leg of mutton, with the instruction that it to be delivered to his home. Mary decided she would intercept the purchase en route. She knew the direction the butcher's boy would have to take and stationed herself on Leeds Bridge. On seeing the boy approach with the parceled up meat at her arms, she proceeded to scold him for taking too long. A time about his errand, manhandling the purchase from him, she said she would take it home to her master's kitchen herself and gave the lad a thump on the back just for good measure. Needless to say, when the time came for the real cook in the Meadow Lane kitchen to prepare dinner, she was left wondering what had become of the delivery of meat. The butcher had sold the mutton after being berated by a decidedly less than satisfied customer and said that his delivery boy had been sent with it an hour since, but that the mutton had been taken off him by a woman purporting to be the customer's cook. The gentleman remem remembered having seen such a woman hanging around the shop earlier. The Batemans weren't destined to dine on stolen mutton that evening. The gentleman had recognised Mary and knew where she lived, and on being greeted by the cooking smells in the Batemans' kitchen, Mary was forced to make good on the cost of the stolen meat, though she was spared the necessity of concocting a lie as to why her husband would find no supper on the table when he came home that evening. In hindsight, as she was fortunate that the wronged party had taken no legal action. Her later victims were less fortunate. Mary was free to carry on, of course, with her life of crime. And that's the end of this part of the Yorkshire Witch, Mary Bateman. Thank you for listening. Many blessings.